construct an ironclad rule that says this is a footprint and this is something made by a wave. Now if they're very clear footprints, it's easy to say, but suppose it's sort of been washed over a little bit by the water, it's not clear, get up in the sink, you get down to the point where you can't really decide anymore. Well that's sort of the situation that we're in. So there's two kind of signals we define. One is deliberate transmissions sent out by another civilization intended for us to find them. The other kind is leakage signals, signals intended for the internal use of another civilization, but which happen to get out, such as our own, do, our own radio and television and radar. That's all going out, and we can't ever bring it back. Well, the leakage signals, we can't make any assumptions about. I mean, we know that our own radiation is so chaotic, we can't begin to understand it. It was just historical accident that things turned out to be on the frequencies they are and transmitted the way they are. On the other hand, intentional signals, we believe we can apply what's called the principle of anti-cryptography. In wartime, we have people who are called cryptographers. It's their job to encode the signals in such a way as to make it as difficult as possible for the other guy to figure out what's going on. Anti-cryptography is the opposite of that. We reason that if someone is going to go to the effort to build a transmitter to send signals to some other civilization, they will make it as easy as possible for the other guy to find them. Because that's the whole idea of why they're trying to do that. So then, with that assumption, it leads us to construction of the search strategy. The danger in all this is another big word called anthropocentrism, looking at things from the viewpoint of man. Just because it's easy for me to go out to the local Radio Shack store and buy a receiver that runs at a certain frequency doesn't mean that that's a good frequency to choose. There has to be more to it than that. Well, so one of the things this has brought us to is what frequency should we be listening at? Imagine now that uh, we're all together in a crowded room someplace, and I want to talk to you way across the room. And imagine that there's, and everybody's just talking. I might have a hard time doing that. But imagine there was all just women talking. And they're talking in relatively high voices. So to communicate to you, I would choose a frequency that was different from what the noise level was. I might try to speak to you in a low voice. And then you'd be able to pick that frequency out of the other noise and interference that was present. We reason the same thing here. It turns out if we add together all the natural noises in the universe, the noise due to the galactic background, uh, the noise due to the quantum radiation, all sorts of noises, and we make a big graph of all these things. We have frequency running this way and noise level this way. The curve looks like this. There is a place where there's minimum noise in the universe. And that isn't something that we created. It's a property of the universe. And we know that, and any other civilization that has astronomers knows that too. And so we reason, they're good communications engineers. For a given amount of transmitter power, they can transmit further and better in that frequency range than any other range they could choose. So we reason, this is the place to start. We can't search all frequencies, all times, all directions. Man is not at that level of development. So we have to start someplace. So we make the assumption this is the place to start. That's the region with 1.4 and 1.7 gigahertz, approximately. So that's where we and almost everybody has been searching. 
There's another strange cosmic coincidence, which is probably unrelated to this. At the low end of this range, at 1.4 gigahertz, is the hydrogen line. That's a natural radio signal transmitted by hydrogen atoms throughout the universe. The hydrogen is the most common element in the universe. At the highest end, about 1.7 gigahertz, there is another spectral line, the hydroxyl line, or the OH line. And those are the only two common lines that there are in this range. Now, some people have waxed very poetic about this and said, well, now we have H at one end, OH at the other end, and H and OH <laughs> makes water. And hence, this is come to be known as the water hole between these two places. And then, it's extended even further to say, well, now, the African water hole is the age-old meeting place of different species. And hence, this is a very nice poetic reference to the water hole from several different angles. And that's why I research in this particular region. But it's probably an accident that the low noise region just happens to be at the same place where these two lines are. Other assumptions we make about anti-cryptography are they won't transmit only on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons. Because we may not be listening then. If, if they're going to make it easy for us to find them, they have to transmit all the time. Because we are the dumb guys here. We're just sort of gradually looking around here and there, and a sooner or later we'll come across them. Like, try to devise a strategy where two needles can find each other in the haystack. The receivers are coming from where the signals come in. Such as the before, which is made out of steel mesh, but for radio signals it looks opaque. That it is a perfect reflector to radio signals. At the other end, there is a parabolic reflector, which is curved both vertically and horizontally, and it has the same screen mesh on it as this reflector, although you can't see that from here. And in between is this large field, which is three acres of concrete, they go over with asphalt with heavy-duty aluminum foil glued onto the top of it. That's called the ground plane. The way that the telescope works, signals come down from the sky, so if well, you're looking at the sun right up there, they hit the flat reflector, they bounce off that, they travel horizontally over the ground plane to the parabolic reflector, which focuses them, sort of like a shaving mirror or something, onto those things that are sitting right out in the middle over there, those things that look like scoops. Gather up the radio signals and direct them under the ground beneath this ground plane where the receivers and computers are located. We'll go into that room a little later in the floor. That's the secret underground laboratory that you all home. The main purpose is to keep down the radiation from the ground. The telescope is so sensitive that it will pick up radio signals from anything that are not at absolute zero, including our bodies. I mean, you didn't know it, but your body is a transmitter at all wavelengths. So is the ground, and so is anything that's around us. So even though those horn antennas, which I call scoops before, are directed that way, still sort of out of the corners of their eyes, they see the rest of the world weakly. And that would generate a great deal of noise and interference. And we don't want that, so this reflector is here to keep the red ground radiation down so it can't get out. So will we be a blip on that for today? Yes. You'll have to explain. There's a rabbit going across the reflector. You've got to move in closer, you can't appreciate this. Now you note this piece of apparatus, right? And this is a toy. And actually, this is a marvel of modern hyper miniature technology. Because if we discover a signal from some other civilization, now just this knob here, whether it's a ring planet, you see, or whether it's a gas giant or a rocky planet, like the stars, I can it. And then by adjusting the starship speed control, I can compensate for the Doppler shift from the motion of their planet with respect to ours, and I can turn the signal in. I can adjust the alien detector knob here so as, to decode, so as to decode the language that they're using and so I can understand that. And after I after I have them tuned in, I have this little microphone here. And I can converse with the alien civilization. And if I conclude that they are friendly and everything is going well, well then we are joining the Galactic Club and we've reached our tuned nirvana of our civilization. But of course the laser destroyer button. <laughs> signal flashes out from the antenna across the universe, leaving our civilization in a totally destroyed state that you see there. And I would have saved humanity from the evil black and